Yep, I'm ready to go whenever you are. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live session. We are happy to have you here with us. I'm going to hand this over to Professor Impey, and then we will start um, asking some questions. Uh, hello, everyone. It's great you're all online, and there are a lot of you. I think we're northward of 150, which I think we may be breaking a record, which is great. Um, and I'm assuming or hoping it's because astronomy is so interesting and not because everyone is so bored being cooped up with coronavirus. But um, And I hope all of you are well, as I am, as we all at this end are. Um, so the floor is open for your questions. So the very first question is from Jean-Pierre, uh, who sent an email, who would like to know, has the amount of energy in the universe changed since the Big Bang, or has um, exclusively conversion from radiation to matter and vice versa taken place? Uh, it's a good question, because physics is obviously um, bolstered by some conservation laws, and the conservation of mass energy is is really foundational to, to laboratory physics and all the physics we've tested so far. And it's a fair question as to whether it applies to the universe as a whole. And basically, the simple answer is yes. If you just track energy and mass since the Big Bang, where the big caveat there is we don't necessarily know where all the energy for the Big Bang itself came from, although there are, there are theories that involve the quantum vacuum. But let's set that aside. Subsequent to the Big Bang, mass energy is conserved. So we see the exchange of mass into energy. Uh, in the very early universe, mass and energy were changing hands freely and continuously. In fact, particle-antiparticle pairs were coming in and out of existence continuously because the temperature was so high that you could create matter and antimatter easily. Um, after some amount of time when the universe cooled, um, and particles and antiparticles mostly annihilated, we were left with a large amount of radiation and a small amount of matter, basically a few hundred million photons for every baryonic particle, which is to say proton-neutron in the universe. Uh, and since then, mass and energy have been conserved. Uh, the other conservation of energy principle that applies is if you look at the total energy of the universe in terms of the gravitational potential energy caused by the fact that there's mass distributed over a distance, and kinetic energy caused by the actual motion of objects through the universe, that total is also conserved. So the total energy of the universe is indeed, as well as we measure it, a constant over cosmic time. Thank you. Um, so the, the, we've had several people um, over the last few live sessions, express an interest in computer science contributions to astronomy. So Buffy, the dark matter hunter, who I has a great screen name, um, would like to know, have the recent breakthroughs in artificial intelligence helped solve any important astronomy problems? Um, so computers have been, you know, essential to astronomy for quite a long time. Um, they're essential to observational astronomy because it's computers that allow us to calculate uh, accurately the positions of objects in the sky, which depends on knowing the orbital parameters of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and so on. Uh, so just observational astronomy has depended on computers for, for decades, really since computers existed. The more recent contributions of computers involve simulating or uh, simulating chunks of the universe, so doing astrophysical simulations in a computer of larger and larger regions of the universe, or of uh, doing simulations of complex astrophysics like general relativity in different situations or the effects of magnetic fields, so magnetohydrodynamics, that's a very complex area of physics that can be simulated in a computer. So computers of increasing power have been used uh, to do these kind of, mo these kind of models of aspects of the universe. The methods of AI or machine learning are more recently applied to astronomy, and those have been very useful too, increasingly useful. Uh, so classification is a, is a business, classifying galaxies, classifying stars, uh, classifying features on a planetary surface. Uh, this was typically done by eye and by hand and very tediously in the past, and now computers are able to be trained uh, with neural nets or with various machine learning methods to identify features reliably and in, on large scale or classify galaxies on large scale. And those methods are, are very heavily used now in astrophysics. 
so I would say astronomers have ridden the wave or the curve of machine learning and AI methods uh, quite extensively in their work, and, and that will undoubtedly continue. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Armando, who's on with us live, who would like to know, <clears throat> do you, is there any form of life on the Earth that is not based on uh, DNA or RNA? And if, um, if not, do you think it's possible that biological life somewhere else in the universe on another exoplanet is based on some other kind of self-replicating molecules? So as well as we know, the answer to that question is fairly simple, no. The, every form of life that we've been able to inspect, whether it's inside rock or in the deep oceans or very remote and difficult to reach places on the earth, it's always been found uh, to be based on nucleic acids, to be based on RNA or DNA as the information storing molecule. So in that sense, it appears that life on Earth did have a common ancestor, a sort of primordial ancestor about four billion years ago that was the basis for all evolution subsequently. Now it's possible, and people hypothesize, that life had multiple starts on the Earth four billion years ago, or perhaps there were experiments in life that failed and then a subsequent experiment turned into everything we see around us. If there had been other forms of life with different genetic basis, it's not ruled out, it's not impossible, um, they would have been competing with our form of life based on uh, cells with nuclei, prokaryotes, and RNA and DNA as the information storing molecules. And in that competition, they lost out. So if there were alternative forms of life on the early Earth, they essentially became food for the successful form of life that represents us. So essentially everything from viruses and bacteria uh, to organisms in the deep sea to plants and animals on the land masses of the earth, all of it has exactly the same genetic makeup, the same genetic code and the same information storing molecule. That's the earth. But of course, once you go beyond the earth to other potentially habitable parts of the universe, which of which we think there are very many, um, it's entirely conceivable that life could have a different molecular basis. Uh, so people have done this either by modeling it theoretically or sometimes computationally in a computer. You can mimic uh, the early processes whereby simple molecules got together to eventually form replicating molecules and cells. We don't know the full process, but you can simulate segments of that evolution. And it's not automatic that you would get the, sing the same set of information storing molecules that our life depends on. So in these sort of uh, simulation worlds, it's entirely possible to have other bases for life. Uh, and so we might imagine that elsewhere in the universe with different starting conditions or different evolutionary paths, that might have happened. Um, the, the problem is we really know best how to look for life that's based on nucleic acids. Uh, so for instance, all the experiments on Mars that will look for life on Mars or fossilized life on Mars are looking for our form of life. Uh, when it's not our form of life, it becomes very hard to test for it, to, to know what you're looking for. And so we're, we're a little bounded in our experiments at the moment in the solar system to look for life as we know it. All right, the next question is from uh, Saiji Sloan, who's on with us live, who would like to know what is responsible for the precession of Mercury's uh, orbital perihelion. So maybe you can explain some of those terms and then explain why it processes. Right. So the perihelion and aphelion are the nearest and farthest approach of a planet from the sun because of the elliptical orbit. Um, and in its orbit of the sun, which takes 88 days, uh, you know, Mercury has a closest point of approach. And if you track out that orbit over time, uh, you find that that position, that point at which it has its closest approach to the sun, uh, migrates with time in the orbit, and that's the precession of the perihelion. So that and that effect is actually caused by a partial effect of general relativity. It's obviously fundamentally gravity that holds Mercury in its orbit, but if you calculate using Newtonian gravity how much that precession of the perihelion should migrate in angle, as seen from the Earth. Uh, you get a slightly different number if you do it in Newtonian gravity and in general relativity. I think the difference is about 42 arc seconds per century. Don't quote me on that, but it's a very small number. Um, and that difference 
in the prediction of how the orbit of the elongated orbit of Mercury precesses in its closest approach to the sun over time becomes a foundational test of general relativity because the Einstein prediction is different from the Newton prediction. And so that effect was seen, was measured, and it became one of the very successful tests of general relativity early in the last century. Um, so, and it happens because, of course, Mercury is the closest object to the sun and so experiences the strongest gravity. Uh, similar effects could apply to Venus or the Earth or Mars, but at that larger distance, the gravity uh, at the Earth's position is, is so much less than felt by Mercury that that would be an unobservable effect. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from one of our live viewers who would like to know if you have any thoughts on what do you think the human um, species might evolve into someday? That's a very interesting question and speculation. Um, it's really hard to say. I mean, you, you look backwards to how we got to this point and maybe that provides some indication. Uh, humans have been anatomically modern. I mean, the human lineage in terms of all the various ancestors, some of whom uh, became extinct and so didn't connect to us, it goes back essentially six million years. That's the deviation uh, in the last apes between say chimpanzees and gorillas and humans, the primate line. Um, humans, anatomically modern humans, date back to roughly 200, maybe 250,000 years ago. So since then we've been anatomically modern. And, and we haven't really changed very much. There have been certain changes in brain chemistry that associate with uh, speech centers in the brain uh, and linguistic capability about 50,000 years ago, but really very little other change. The evolutionary changes that led up to the last phase of human evolution in Homo sapiens involved uh, elongation of the head, so the skull became more uh, upright, the forehead more direct, uh, uh, less heavy brow, um, a thinner cranium, uh, more erect posture, uh, gait that was designed for walking rather than the original climbing that apes did. Uh, so the human form became more slender over time as we adapted to a, a nomadic existence. Now, of course, you might say, well, we have a more sedentary existence. People get exercise, but most people spend a lot of time sitting in chairs in front of computers. And so if you were going to guess based on modern lifestyles, uh, you could guess that humans will evolve their shape and their function uh, in certain ways based on our lifestyle. Uh, human vision is, for instance, getting worse because uh, we tax our eyes. We don't no longer depend on our eyes for tracking game or hunting game. So certain human capabilities uh, have got worse over time. And so we're becoming maladapted at some level. As for what will happen in the far future, it's really hard to tell. It depends on our environment and we are sculpted by our environment. If we moved off Earth, for example, humans would change probably quite rapidly if they were subject to a less gravity of Mars or the moon. Um, so evolutionary biologists have played this game of what would happen to humans. And the basic answer is they get more slender, they get taller, um, they become more hairless. Um, they're, the acuity of their visual and hearing apparatus actually degrades because they're less essential for survival. And so there, there are various changes that are predicted by evolutionary biologists. Thank you very much. Um, so the next question is, I guess there was a paper that um, came out recently about the um, universe being anisotropic. And um, there was one about um, the orientation of quasars possibly having a preferred direction and somebody else is saying that the um, it said that the universe doesn't expand equally in all directions so what are your thoughts on this um, is it possible and if it's true what are the sort of cosmological implications um, if it's true the implications are quite profound but let me just back off to what this the question is about it's about a core assumption of cosmology. Modern cosmology is based on what's called the cosmological principle. The cosmological principle, uh, which is an assumption which we hope to be able to experimentally verify, otherwise our cosmology is flawed, involves two components. It's that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Those two words have different meanings. Homogeneous means 
the same at all locations on average. And isotropic means the same in all directions, looking out from the Earth. And these are both important assumptions, and they are essentially Copernican principle. They're saying that we live in a typical region of the universe, that there's nothing special, unusual, or weird about the part of the universe we live in. And by part of the universe, I mean scales of tens or hundreds of millions of light years, so very large scales. The different parts of this principle, some are easier to test than the others. Uh, the homogeneity principle is actually very hard to test because you can to say that the universe is the same at all locations is impossible to test because we can't relocate ourselves hundreds of millions of light years away. So all we can do is look out in space and decide that the types of galaxies we see or their distribution in space is not particularly different at any far location than it is around the Milky Way. The problem is when we look out in space, we're looking back in time. So we're comparing the homogeneity of the universe as it was with the homogeneity of the universe as it is around us. And so we have to know something about how the universe evolves to make that comparison. So that's a problem. But given that limitation, the universe does seem to be homogeneous. There's nothing special about our location in space on large scales. The anisotropy, which is the nature of the, 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 the core of the question, uh, but these two ideas are linked together in the cosmological principle. Anisotropy means the same in every direction. And generally, people have found that anisotropy, uh, isotropy is shown to be correct. The best example of that is the microwave background radiation. That's the relic radiation from the Big Bang. And when we look out in space, we see a temperature of microwaves that is no different in opposite directions of the sky or in any direction by more than one part in 10 to the 5, extremely uniform or isotropic. So the microwave radiation is a really good example of the fact that we do live in an isotropic universe. However, people haven't been content with that, and so they've looked for other anisotropies in the forms of objects in space, like quasars or galaxies, or the way galaxies move in different directions. And every now and then, and there's been one recently, and pretty much I see papers about this every few years, suggesting that in some phenomena or other, there appears to be something special going on in some direction in the sky compared to some other direction in the sky. Um, the, the simple conclusion, though, is that in the fullness of time and with sufficient data, most of these claims have gone away. Um, and so anisotropy has not persisted in the literature as a phenomenon that we have to explain. However, if it did, if anisotropy were observed on a large scale, it would be a serious problem for cosmology because it would also mean the Copernican principle did not hold. We didn't live in a typical region of the universe, or the universe was different in one direction than another. And, and the standard Big Bang model would have a really great difficulty in explaining that. So most astronomers hope isotropy is preserved, but of course astronomers are good at their job and they go out and get data and they try and push the model and find out if it's actually correct. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Enlightening Knowledge, who's on with us live, who's interested in about comets um, in, in particular sort of their uh, life cycles. It is said that the tail of a comet is due to um, melting ice and once it melts, it becomes an asteroid. So what about Halley's Comet? its ice must be melting too, right? But it reappears every 76 years, so will it ever run out of ice? Um, short answer, yes. Uh, comets evolve, and so uh, the inference, if that mechanism is correct, and the question was framed correctly, it is the fact that as comets, especially those that come near the sun, and really only those that come near the sun, uh, when they approach the sun, uh, the volatile materials in the comet, which is to say the frozen gases and ices, are melted or vaporized off and disappear into space, and part of them form the comet tail. The tail is also made of dust particles, too, so solid particles. Um, and obviously, there's a finite inventory of those frozen gases and liquids in a comet, and so that can't last forever, and eventually a comet will dry out. By that token, uh, Halley's Comet is known to be a fairly young comet, so it has not probably either been in the inner solar system or had more than a few hundred passages around the sun. Remember, its orbital period is 86 years, so that implies Halley's Comet may only have been in the inner solar system for a few hundred thousand, maybe a few million years. Uh, now, comets can have their orbits uh, altered by interactions with planets or 
uh, other large bodies. And so uh, a comet that is in close proximity to the sun in its innermost part of its orbit doesn't always have to stay that way or may not have always been that way. So that's why it's really hard to say how old a comet is. And regardless of this effect, but in general, it's true that the comets that pass close to the sun and have been seen to do it periodically will eventually dry out and become the same as asteroids. However, uh, most comets don't do that. The comet cloud, the, the Kuiper, uh, sorry, the Oort cloud, a uh, cloud of comets that is essentially a spherical distribution of comets out to distances of 50 to 100,000 astronomical units. So the deep freeze of interstellar space the vast majority of them, and they are estimated to number about a trillion, uh, never come close to the sun. Uh, they'll be in big looping elliptical orbits that come in and out of the solar system, but not really close enough to the sun to boil off their frozen gases and, salt and liquids. And so the vast majority of comets are frozen uh, rocky ice balls uh, that will stay that way essentially forever, however long they orbit. So it's only a very small subset of comets that experience this ablation of their uh, vapor, of their volatile materials. All right, uh, the next question is from Robert, who's on with us live. Um, in the search for life, it seems like the focus has moved from Europa and Titan to Enceladus. Do you think that perception's correct? And also, what do you think is the best target for looking for life in the local universe? Um, yeah, I think, I'm not sure the focus has completely shifted to Enceladus. Uh, those are the three objects, however, in the outer solar system that are atop of everyone's list of priorities, uh, by which I mean NASA, European Space Agency, uh, the Japanese Space Agency is doing planetary missions, essentially all the major players in planetary science. And so there are a set of, a small set of missions uh, designed in the next 10 to 15 years to go to each of those three objects. The one that's the most far advanced is the Europa Clipper mission, which has changed its name and its, um, its scope uh, several times in the last five or six years. But it's definitely going to go to Europa. Also, because of the now the maturing of the drone technology, the Titan sort of drone mission, um, Dragonfly as it's called, that's the code name for it, that's also on a fast track, and that's a very exciting mission. Uh, the Enceladus mission will not be a lander, it'll be a flyby with just more sophisticated instrumentation. So in a sense, uh, uh, a Titan is probably the most compelling target because it's unlikely we could melt through the ice pack of Europa to get into its ocean. And it's unlikely we could make a mission clever, clever enough to land on Enceladus where a geyser happens to be spewing out ice particles right there and measure the ice particles as they come out. More likely is that we will be able to go to Titan with one of these drone type technologies and sample many of the frozen, the liquid hydrocarbon lakes on Titan. And that's a totally feasible technology. So that's uh, the most exciting prospect, I think, in the near, in the near term for looking for life. But of course, it will be life unlike anything on Earth if we find it there, which makes it either exciting or a little risky, depending on your point of view. All right. The, the next question is from Martin, who sent an email um, talking, uh, asking about um, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies. Um, you've said that galaxies converge and combine and that um, each galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center of it. Is there any evidence of some kind of a scar or, you know, leftover trail from where those black holes scythed through to the other galaxies? Um, is there, you know, can we see evidence of where that was happening? If we were able to catch two galaxies merging in the act, uh, yes, we probably would be able to see the effect of the, the massive black hole plowing through the central region of a galaxy, sort of kicking out you know, it would absorb and engulf some stars, but it would also use it, its strong gravity would also eject some stars from the central region. So it would definitely kick up a fuss in the center of a galaxy. Uh, we've never, just by luck, and because those merger events take a small fraction of the age of the universe, we've just not been lucky enough to find an example of that happening as we speak. We do think we found examples of objects where it's going to happen. So there are a couple of Cases known where there a, where a galaxy 
appears to have a binary supermassive black hole in the center. That is two black holes that are in the process of merging but haven't got there yet. But they've both settled to very close to the center of the galaxy, and so it's going to happen. Uh, but going to happen in astronomy means millions of years from now, so there's no point in waiting. Uh, and then we've clearly seen examples of galaxies that are headed towards each other or in a cluster, and they're going to merge. Uh, but again, the time scales for that are could be hundreds of thousands or millions of years. So it's sort of a problem of timing where the time that the effect you're talking about, the chaos of the black holes plowing right through the central regions as they merge, is such a short period of time compared to the overall overall orbital time of galaxies around each other or the age of the universe, that we'd have to be very lucky to find an example of it, and we haven't so far. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we have a couple of questions about stars forming. So the first one is um, stars seem to always form in a star forming region. What about our star, the sun? Um, where What happened to its star forming region? Uh, the best ideas we have, based on observations of regions where stars are forming right now, so we can study the process up close, are that stars really don't form singly. They're, they are not this idealized situation of a nearly spherical cloud of gas and dust that collapses to form a star and planets around it. Stars tend to form in overly dense regions of a galaxy, like a disk, like the spiral disk of the Milky Way. And in those regions, um, multiple stars will form. Essentially, the cloud will collapse, and then there'll be subfragmentation within the collapsing cloud so that subregions collapse to form individual stars. But then they form close to each other out of really the same nebula. Um, and that's how we think stars form. The Orion Nebula is a really good example of that happening in a part of space we can see very well. So we think that stars form in, in clusters, essentially. And we think that the sun formed in a cluster, too. Uh, it's, it's not, a sun is obviously not a binary star, but it was probably part of a group of stars. But if you look around, we don't have any close companions, and so the question is, why? And the answer to that is, is fairly simple, because the sun is four and a half billion years old, and its orbit of the galaxy in the disk is about a quarter of a billion years. So the, so the sun has been around the Milky Way, complete orbits of the Milky Way, about 18 times. And as it does that orbit, it also undulates in and out of the disk, what's called the Z motion or the Z motion, up and down. And what that means is that the sun, in the end, has migrated very, very far away from its region of formation. And so any stars that happened to form near us in space four and a half billion years ago have migrated, drifted, interacted with other stars, and have moved very far away. So there's no trace around the sun of its formation conditions four and a half billion years ago. The, the Milky Way is a big churning system of stars, and it just doesn't preserve that information. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, so that actually answered two questions that we had. Um, and then the other related question is, can large uh, gas giant planets ever collide or combine to form a star, maybe even a low mass star like a red dwarf. Is that something that we've seen or that is possible? It's possible in principle. We've never seen it, and, and some people theoretically think that it's very unlikely. Um, first of all, you would have to have two planets, say, two giant planets that were together large enough to exceed the fusion limit for a star. And the fusion limit for a star is 8% of the mass of the sun. So if you took two of the biggest mass planets we know about. So, so we've seen planets that go up in size to about 10 and sometimes 15 times the mass of Jupiter. If you just happen to have two of the biggest gas giant planets we know of and you combine them, you could just get yourself above the fusion limit. So it's possible in principle, but really, in general, most planets, even Jupiter-like planets, are so much less massive than the least massive star, that that's a very unlikely way to form a star. Uh, that's why the science fictional concept that Arthur C. Clarke had, where if you could just add some mass to Jupiter, you'd turn it into a companion low mass star of the sun, was, was very fanciful. I mean, Arthur C. Clarke knew his science too, and I'm sure he knew he was pushing uh, the bounds of astrophysics with that idea. So that really can't happen. 
All right, so that answered questions from Enlightening Knowledge, Anuj, and Narun Joe. Um, the next question is from a live viewer, a world citizen, who would like to know um, if you can talk about how how do liquids behave in space? Will they float like humans do? Liquids uh, don't exist in space uh, because space is too cold. So if you remember, the uh, microwave background radiation is a, is a measure of the temperature of intergalactic space, and it's three degrees above absolute zero. That is so cold that even helium, uh, very inert gas, will form a liquid. And so uh, interstellar space, the space between stars, is not quite that cold. It's maybe 10 or 15 degrees Kelvin. But basically, uh, all of the major liquids we're familiar with, uh, water being the obvious example, but other related to that, methane, ethane, et cetera, uh, hydrocarbons, simple hydrocarbons, these would all be frozen at that temperature. And so there's really no uh, liquid in space, no free liquid. There are, of course, individual molecules uh, that if they came together might form a liquid. So there are water molecules in space, in deep space, and, and an individual water molecule uh, you know, can have a very low temperature, but it's just a molecule. Uh, but there's no particular situation without shielding and heating by a substantial amount for a liquid to form in space. Oops, sorry. Um, all right. The next question is from Amir, who sent an email. And Amir would like to know how is it that we measure the mass of a star? And um, I guess Amir is confused about the connections between measurements of luminosity and the measurement of mass, that kind of thing. Right. So mass, of all the fundamental properties of a star, um, the most important property in terms of a star's life is its mass. Uh, in terms of the theory of stars, if you know what the mass of a star is at birth, you can predict its entire course of its life, how it's going to lose mass, what elements it will create in its cores, and how it will die. So mass determines the fate of a star. Um, and so it's the fundamental property of stars. But observationally, uh, it's the hardest thing to measure because we have no handle on mass unless a star is part of a binary or multiple system. So typically, it's a small subset of stars where we measure mass when they're in a binary orbit, and we can apply Kepler's laws to the orbit. So we have enough measurements and a small enough number of degrees of freedom in the calculation to get the mass ratio and then the individual masses of the two stars. But for an isolated star, we can't measure its mass. There's just no handle on it. Luminosity, however, is easier to get because to do that, all you need to do is know how much radiation you receive from the star at its distance, um, to collect it through a telescope, and its distance. Um, so if you measure the distance and you know how much radiation you collect with a telescope, you can calculate its intrinsic luminosity, which is to say how many photons per second it's putting out in all directions. So there, the issue of luminosity comes down to measuring distance. And distance can be measured by parallax if the star is less than a few hundred light years away, that's direct trigonometry, or there are a set of more indirect measures of distance for stars up to tens of thousands of light years away. So basically, uh, luminosity is much easier to measure than mass because it just requires us getting a distance. Another stellar quantity that's very hard to measure observationally is size or radius. Uh, stars are, are physically large, of course. The sun is enormous, a million kilometers across. But stars are trillions of miles away. And so when we look at them with a telescope, even in space telescope with no atmosphere to blur the image, you can't actually see the true size of a star. It's just too small. The angular size is too small to resolve with a telescope. So stellar radius is not really something we can measure directly, except for very large giant stars that happen to be nearby. And once again, uh, star size just comes out of a model of the star. So given the mass, and measuring the luminosity, because you measure the distance, you can say what the size of a star is. But it's something you calculate, not something you measure. All right, thank you very much. Um, the next question is from um, Mernoush, who's on with us live, who would like to know, how big is the non-observable universe compared to uh, the universe that we can see? That's an interesting question, and the simple answer is we don't know. Um, we do know, however, that the universe was expanding at 
any two points in the universe were moving away from each other faster than light speed for the first six billion years or so of cosmic evolution. And so that tells us that there are regions of space predicted by the Big Bang model and the cosmic expansion that we're a part of that we uh, cannot see. We have not seen in the history of the universe. And if the acceleration of dark energy is correct, we will never see because they'll just be dragged further and further away from our telescopes. So if you put uh, if you put out a model of the Big Bang and ask what is the relative size of the universe you can see where light has had time to reach you in 14 billion years compared to the totality of space that might exist that's been moving away from us faster than light speed early in the history of the universe, that's a slightly uncertain calculation. And I've read different numbers like a factor of 100 or 1,000, maybe even more. So the physical universe, the total universe, could be hundreds or thousands of times larger than the visible or observable universe. All right. Um, the next question is from one of our um, uh, email um, participants. Um, who would like to know, what do you think about the TRAPPIST system of exoplanets that was discovered recently as being a good candidate to actively research uh, habitability? Oh, it's, <clears throat> it's an excellent system. Um, it's an amazingly rich system. It has seven planets confirmed, and there's a speculation that there may be a couple more. Uh, and uh, three, or depending on how you define it, three or four of them are habitable. They're sort of Earth-like or within a factor of two or three of Earth parameters, um, which is to say they're in the habitable zone of their somewhat dim star. So that's a fantastic treasure trove to have in one exoplanet system, to have that many planets in total and to have three or four that may be habitable and somewhat Earth-like. The, the caveat or the limitation is that that's not a very nearby system. It's hundreds of light years away. I forget the exact number. So it's a system that's going to be hard to follow up with other methods. Um, what we really want to do to make progress on following, a hab following up habitable exoplanets is find some habitable exoplanets that are much closer than the kind that Kepler was finding. And that means we need to find planets from the TESS uh, satellite that's up now. TESS is going to do what Kepler did only over the entire sky uh, for typically much closer systems. And so TESS is probably going to turn up habitable exoplanets that may be only 10, 15, 20 light years away. Uh, and those would be fascinating to follow up. Um, OK, the next question is from one of our uh, live viewers. And several people have seconded this, which is one of the reasons I'm asking it. Um, and we've discussed this a little bit before. But can you suggest um, any good books? Um, that uh, people can read with or trying to get involved? So maybe like a, a beginner level book and then maybe a more advanced level book for people who are interested in you know going beyond what we've talked about in our course and learning more about astronomy. Right. Well, um, there's a number that you can pick. I mean, if you want, if you want to risk getting into the math a little bit, um, which is to say mostly algebra and a little bit of calculus, then there are sort of textbooks, sort of these are for science majors, but for first two year science majors, so not you know advanced level. Uh, there's an introductory textbook, I think it's called Introductory Astrophysics by Mike Zeilik, Z-E-I-L-I-K. That's a good one. It's an encyclopedic, it's large, I think it's a thousand pages, covers the entire subject. And and you know, you can dodge the heavily math intensive pieces because it describes astrophysics in general. There's another one at a similar level with a similar level of authority by Carol and Ostley. That's Carol with two R's and two L's and O-S-T-L-I-E. So those are two of the classic textbooks that are aimed at astrophysics majors but in the introductory level. So this, that's, you know, getting yourself some good ambition, but why not? So you want, you want the full story there. Um, there are, there are many more books that are written at a more popular level, um, and they're not at a much higher level than the material on our online courses. So, um, you know, if you really want to challenge yourself, then I'd almost suggest you move up to one of those uh, early level textbooks. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from Doctress Newtopia, 
um, who would like to know what you think about um, mining asteroids or mining the asteroid belt for natural resources. Uh, do you think it's possible? Do you think it's practical? Do you think it's a good idea? Well, it's it's become a hot topic because as the privatization of space continues and we see Blue Origins and SpaceX competing uh, to send missions to service the space station or to send tourists into orbit and maybe to the moon and Mars beyond that, uh, it's fairly likely that a commercial space activity is going to take off. And there are people who've had their ideas on mining asteroids for some time. The feasibility of it is... There's actually no showstopper. That none of this is impossible technology or science. Um, the lure is that if you take an appropriately selected near-Earth asteroid with size about half a kilometer, as I recall, it has something like, at current market value, about $2 trillion worth of precious metals and about $2 trillion worth of rare Earths. Rare Earths are, as you know, things that the semiconductor industry and the car industry and others depend on, and they are tend to be held by a very small number of countries who exert geopolitical leverage over those resources. So the advantages of having a ready-made source of uh, precious metals and rare earths that you could just harvest from space would be enormous. Now that lure, market value of trillions of dollars, is obviously sufficient to fund an industry to try and do this. The method, again, is sounds challenging, but it's not unfeasible. You'd have to find the right nature of an asteroid. You'd have to do the geochemistry remotely to figure out that it was worth an asteroid worth your time and attention and the right mass and size. Uh, then you would want to bring it into a captured orbit of the Earth-Moon system. Capturing it into the, a pure circularized Earth orbit is actually too hard. The mechanics of that are too hard much more feasible is to capture it into a very elongated orbit of the Earth-Moon system. Now, how would you do that? Well, you'd obviously send space probes out to it, and you'd drill into it and attach rockets to it and essentially turn it into a steerable object. You couldn't steer it massively that way. You'd have to sort of use its natural Earth-approaching orbit to steer it into a captured Earth-Moon system orbit. And the mechanics and the, uh, the technology to do that, they, they exist. I mean, there is really no showstopper there. So how far away is this? Maybe 10, 15 years. Now, there's always a danger. Well, there are two dangers. The, the, the big danger that most people will worry about is whoever's, uh, whatever cowboy is lassoing this asteroid, do they know enough to stop it hitting the Earth? Half a kilometer asteroid, that can cause a real bit of damage. That's one issue. The second issue is when you've uh, harnessed that many resources, how do you bring them down to the Earth in volume? And, th and that's not trivial either, and that could be very expensive. And then, of course, even if you figured that one out, your problem is if you saturate the market, uh, you're going to do what the Bunker Brothers did with silver in the 1980s in Texas, and you'll crater the price of the asset you are trying to corner the market in. So I would say there are a number of hazards of mining asteroids, but really, I think it's going to happen. All right. Um, uh, before I go on to the next question real quickly, I want to mention to um, the folks that are on with us live, um, some of your questions we have answered um, in previous uh, live sessions. So if we don't get to your question today, make sure you look back at those previous live sessions. For example, we've recently talked about the James Webb Space Telescope. So um, the only reason that I'm skipping that one this week is because we've recently talked about it. Um, so just keep in mind that we've done a few of these recently. And so if your question gets skipped, um, you might want to check out recent live sessions because we may have addressed it there. Um, so that um, being said, I can, I can give, uh, I'll just give oh, a slight update on that, on the James Webb, since that question will come up and, th and the situation is changing. That's why it's worth a little update. Um, the update on the James Webb is its launch date had been set for October next year. It's obviously massively late and over budget, budget heading towards $10 billion, and Congress put a hard cap on that. So it's a, it's a project in real trouble if it goes over its budget cap. Now, of course, unforeseen circumstances have taken place. Uh, with the coronavirus shutdown of the U.S. economy, the major contractors like Raytheon that are working on the James Webb instrumentation and integration of the spacecraft and instruments are also shut down. And so work on the James Webb is essentially halted. Now, luckily, most of the hard work had already been done. The instruments have already passed their tests. The telescope has been built. The structure, the mirrors are all fine and have been tested. 
but the integration assembly and final testing is a substantial amount of work and that's on hold. And so as we speak, NASA announced this just uh, last week, the launch date for James Webb is essentially marching forward by a day per day as the US economy and those contractors are shut down with the coronavirus. Um, James Webb is in, not doesn't rely on any particular orbital configuration or juxtaposition like a Mars mission on its launch date, it's going to a Lagrange point. Um, so it doesn't have a particular launch window. It can be delayed three weeks, six weeks, two months, and just launch whenever it's able to be. Obviously, the longer the delay, the more money is, is being costed to keep the marching army of engineers and technicians and scientists employed, because you can't just send them all away when it's not ready. Um, and I've asked, uh, Marsha Riki is one of the, is a fellow faculty member and a principal investigator of one of the James Webb instruments. And she says that um, even with the current delays of a, a launch date delay per day, um, the increased cost for the contractors and the scientists is not hitting the budget cap yet and won't for a couple of months. So as long as we reemerge from the coronavirus shutdown in a couple of months, I think things are okay for the James Webb, but its launch date will probably slip into 2022. Well, thank you very much for that update. Um, Wolf and Bree, who's on with us live, would um, have a question that is, some scientists believe they have found fossils from the Hadean period or Hadean period. Um, how likely do you think that these are actually organisms rather than some chemical reaction in the rock? Yeah, that's a good question because it's a very controversial field. Um, the Hadean era essentially runs from the Earth's formation uh, 4.5 billion years ago to about 3.9 billion years. So it's the first roughly half billion years of the Earth's history when the Earth was you know, unspeakably hot and there were uh, meteor impacts on the surface you know, at 100 times the rate of present day, when volcanism was extreme, when uh, the oceans had just formed and the atmosphere was toxic and unbreathable to us. So very strange, a very nasty place. Naming it after Hades is quite appropriate. The problem with any claim of life that far back is that there's almost no rock that survives intact from that long ago. The Earth was such a violent place and the Earth has resurfaced, the average part of the Earth is resurfaced every few hundred million years. So uh, you know, the odds are very low that you're going to find a rock that's been sitting around for four billion years without alteration. Uh, it's hard to find rocks that are that old at all. And even if you do find them, they're probably been subject to volcanism or metamorphosis by heat and pressure. And so whatever evidence might be in the rock has been tortured by the rock's history. So that is the framework for which most people are very skeptical about claims for biology going that far back. The other reason is the nature of the evidence itself. There, even back to the date where we think the evidence is pretty good, 3.7 to 3.8 billion years, that's the oldest evidence for life where people tend to agree on it. These are not fossils. There are no body fossils because life was, of course, microbial. And all you're looking at is the way that a microbe or perhaps a group of microbes have altered the surrounding rock. And the way they do that is through their metabolism. And the way they do that is by metabolizing radioactive and normal carbon at different rates. So essentially, when you look for life in the super old rocks, you're looking for isotopic imbalances, uh, primarily of carbon and oxygen, uh, based on the metabolism of the microbe you think you're finding. And that's very indirect evidence. There's no morphological trace. If you looked at the rock, even under a microscope, there's nothing to tell you that there was life there. And the nature of that evidence naturally is leads it to be suspected. And you have to have a unique interpretation of whatever isotopic ratios you found that could only be interpreted in terms of biology. And for those reasons, uh, none of the possible claims of life before 3.7, 3.8 billion years have stood the test of time. And some people think it's a, even in principle impossible to prove that life existed that far back. The next question is from Profile for Fun, um, who would like to know, um, does our location inside of our galaxy affect our daily life? Um, it doesn't affect our daily life that much. We're sort of, uh, you know, we're in a bubble in a sense. We're in a low-ish density region of the galaxy. We're near 
uh, we're between two spiral arms, so we're not in a very high density region. If we were in a higher density region, the possibility of, of interactions with other stars or chaos in the solar system from gravitational effects would be substantial. That might not affect our everyday life, but that would affect the history of life on Earth. Um, we, uh, the way it affects your daily life really is the appearance of the night sky because we have a Milky Way in the sky. If we were positioned elsewhere in the galaxy or above the plane of the galaxy, say in the halo, the sky would look really quite different. The, the sky might, might be much, much darker than it is because the Milky Way casts a fair amount of light through the night sky. So that's probably the most obvious and simple way that our position in the galaxy affects our, our daily life, something we can see in the night sky. Otherwise, the effects on, on life in general are much more occasional. So as the Earth moves in its orbit of the galaxy every quarter billion years, it goes in and out of the plane of the galaxy, and that takes us through dense amounts of material, which can increase the impact rate on the Earth. And so there's evidence that some of the mass extinctions in history, or some of the smaller extinctions, could be caused by the density of the region of the galaxy we happen to be inhabiting at that particular time in the galaxy's rotation and history. Those are the real incidents. The other effect of our position in the galaxy is that it, being in a moderately low density region, there's not a lot of stellar mayhem happening near us. If we were in a much denser part of the galaxy, the rate of supernovae going off, uh, which can be damaging to the Earth, of course, if they're less than a few dozen light years, would be much higher, and that could have possibly affected life on Earth or even in our lifetimes. So luckily, we're in a, a sort of quiet suburb of the galaxy, and it's probably better that we are. Um, a brief follow-up to that question is, uh, is it possible to have life on a planet around a star which is not in a galaxy? Uh, sure. Um, the It's entirely possible. So um, you can have stars that are ejected from galaxies. We know that. We've seen some examples of stars whose, uh, mo whose space motions indicate that they're no longer bound to their galaxy. They may actually be in the galaxy as we see them, but they've essentially become unbound by some interaction and they're ejected. And we can therefore hypothesize that stars that suffered that a long time ago are in intergalactic space. So there are definitely... Um, stars in intergalactic space. That's essentially a certainty, even though we can't see them directly for the most part. Uh, those stars, of course, could have planets around them, um, and they could provide enough energy to support life on those planets. So you absolutely could have uh, intergalactic stars with planets hosting life in a quite different situation. You could even have situations where planets were ejected from their stars uh, and moved elsewhere in the galaxy. So you can definitely have free-floating planets without parent stars because they suffered an interaction and got ejected. They're called nomads. Now, if they were an Earth-like planet, that probably wouldn't work because Earth life depends on the sun being nearby. But if it had, was a super-Earth with a heavy, dense atmosphere and enough internal energy to create heating on the surface, it would have its own ecosystem and wouldn't actually depend on stellar radiation to support life. So you could even have a living planet, hypothetically, a super-Earth, that existed independent of a parent star. Um, the next question is about um, very, very distant objects. Um, so we've had two people ask questions, one about galaxies and one about stars, um, that very far, uh, that objects that are very far away could have, um, even though we see them now, they could be um, dead, you know, these these galaxies could have died or the stars could be um, exploded. So first mm -hmm. of all, can you explain how that works? And, you know, is that possible for A, a star and B, a galaxy? I it's, think it's easier to think of in terms of a star. And the answer is absolutely it's possible. If, for example, we saw a star that I mean, it, it's very hard to do chronology of stars to measure the exact age of stars. But just say we uh, saw a very massive star that we knew to be very near the end of its life, for example, because it was creating uh, iron. So it was in the last fusion stage of a massive star before it collapses and dies as a supernova. So a massive star that will die as a supernova in the last stage of making heavy elements. And we could measure that from the Earth. And if that star was far enough away, let's just say it was on the other side of the galaxy, for example, uh, so 100,000 light years away, um, 
the light we were seeing indicating that the star was very close to exhausting its nuclear fuel was 100,000 years old as we saw it. Uh, so we were seeing the star as it was 100,000 years ago. So as we received that radiation, we could ask the question, does that star still exist? And if it was within 100,000 years of blowing up as a supernova, the answer would be no. Uh, as we speak simultaneously now, that star does no longer exist. So it's absolutely possible to have a situation where you observe a star near its death, and because of its distance, you know that as you observe it in real time, the star is dead. But you just have to wait to get that information because of the time it takes light to travel through space. So that's definitely possible. Um, for a galaxy, it's more complicated because galaxies uh, don't have usually a single age. Galaxies form in stages by complex mergers. Their stars are not all the same age. And so um, we do indeed see distant galaxies as they were um, many billions of years ago. So the most distant galaxies we see are about 13 billion light years away. So the light we see is 13 billion years old. And you could say, well, what are those galaxies doing now, 13 billion years later? And they may well have faded and changed form and turned into something else by that amount of time. Uh, we'll never know. We're just using our knowledge of astrophysics to predict what has happened subsequent to us receiving that radiation. All right, it is 2.02. Um, Chris, I'll let you make the call on whether you have time for one more question or whether sure. we need to end. We'll do one more, sure. Okay, um, the, the last question that we'll take today is from Devesh, um, who's on with us live, who would like to know, how can our understanding of gravitational waves give us a better perspective on other cosmic events? Well, it's turning into a very interesting field. So the, the detection of gravitational waves in 2016, 2015, 2016 was a, a milestone in astronomy, led to the award and within a couple of years of a Nobel Prize. Um, it's foundational, but when you only get gravity waves from something, there's a limit to what you can know because our ability to position the target on the sky is very limited. Gravitational wave detectors don't give you good positional accuracy like a telescope does. What's very more much more interesting in terms of learning the astrophysics of these systems is what's called multi-messenger astronomy. So subsequent to black hole mergers, we also started to detect neutron star mergers. And those neutron star mergers kick out a lot of gravity waves, so LIGO can detect them, Virgo can detect them, but they also create electromagnetic radiation. So we now have a set of objects, uh, neutron star mergers, and in principle, black hole merging with a neutron star as well, where we have radiation at visible X-ray radio wavelengths to go along with the gravitational waves. And that suite of information really only exists for a handful of objects so far, but we anticipate dozens more when LIGO comes back online with increased sensitivity. That suite of information is, is enormously powerful in understanding what happens when collapsed objects die and merge. So that's a whole new area of astronomy called multi-messenger astronomy because the messengers involve gravity waves and electromagnetic radiation. And it's probably causing the biggest buzz and excitement in the research community right now. It's a good question to end with because it's a hot area of astronomy. And I thank you for all your great questions and your great attendance and numbers on this uh, live session. And we'll uh, keep going with once a week and we'll again move the day and time around so that we can catch as many of you as possible. Thank you very much. And thanks to Alexander and Matthew for facilitating.